Hi. So we've got an incredibly whistle-stop one hour on the entire of the management of infection, antimicrobials and urinary tract infection. As ever, we really don't have time to cover all the topics in depth. There's lots more information on the Moodle. Please use it. This lecture will be slide cut and be up on the Moodle as well. These are the learning objectives. I have no intention of reading them out. You can look at the slides. Um, and clearly, we can't cover all this in an hour. But these are the things that we think you need to know about the management of infection. So when we're thinking about urinary tract infection, you think about the anatomy of the urinary tract. It can divide it into lower UTI and upper UTI. Lower UTI, or usually commonly called cystitis, is um, very common, mainly seen in the community, but occasionally presents to hospital. Occurs because of the spread of, spread of gut organisms from the perineum via the urethra, and is therefore much commoner in females because of the anatomy. In young men, it's so common, uncommon as to warrant further testing if you see it in a young, healthy man. Presents with the symptoms of dysuria, frequency, and suprapubic or bladder pain. Upper urinary tract infection, commonly called pyelonephritis from the infection of the kidney, um, is usually caused by ascending infection from the bladder, um, but it can occasionally occur because of hematogenous spread. This is more common in diabetics and can be seen with the particularly severe condition known as emphysematous pyelonephritis, where you get gas-forming organisms within the substance of the kidney, which has a mortality of 70%. So it's a particularly severe infection. Presents with the same symptoms as lower UTI, but in addition, systemic symptoms of fever, loin pain, and sepsis. The bacterial or organism causes of urinary tract infection, far and away the most common are gut organisms, um, particularly E. coli, which represents somewhere between 75 and 90% of all isolates um, in urinary tract infection in most series. And then the whole gamut of other coliforms and other gram-negative rods behind. Um, occasionally, we can see gram-positives. Staphylococcus saprophyticus is particularly seen in young females, um, about 5% of all urinary tract infection. And then other organisms coming along behind, more commonly seen in hospital practice than in the community. There are a number of predispositions to UTI that it's worth thinking about if you have got a patient in front of you. As we discussed, being female is a big risk factor. And having an abnormal urinary tract is the other big risk factor. Stones are a foreign body within the urinary tract, present a nidus for bacteria to settle on where the immune system can't clear them, and so a big risk factor. Congenital abnormality, particularly posterior urethral valves in babies, where the urine backs up um, at the urethrophysical junction, and therefore you get stagnation and predisposition to infection, and prostatism in elderly men. Pregnancy is a risk factor um, because... Women who are pregnant both have immunosuppression as a result of the pregnancy and also because the hormonal changes in pregnancy lead to relaxation of the smooth muscle and again encourage pooling of the urine in the urinary tract. Being catheterized, single biggest risk factor in hospital, obviously, if you stick a great big foreign body, which is a plastic catheter into somebody's bladder, you present a nidus for bacteria to settle. Whether diabetes is a risk factor is actually still debated. Patients with diabetes get more severe urinary tract infections um, and they have are more likely to have glycosuria, which can encourage the growth of bacteria in the urinary tract. Bacterial causes of UTI, well, we talked about the organisms. Um, last week, Professor Pallon talked a bit about E. coli and the huge diversity of these organisms. As I said, the vast majority of UTI is caused by E. coli, and these are ones which have pathogenicity islands, which are sections of DNA which encode factors which enable the bacteria to settle and persist within the urinary tract. Diagnosis, we touched on last week, and as always, it starts with your history and clinical examination. Um, in the community, the history of urinary tract infection in a young woman is so pathognomonic as to not require any further diagnostic tests, and these are now not recommended by the Royal College of General Practitioners. I put the flowchart for the diagnosis of UTI up on the Moodle for you. Um, a young woman with dysuria, bladder pain, and pain, and that is pain on passing urine, um, would be expected to be treated with simple antibiotics in the community without any further tests. However, in hospital, you're much more likely to want to send a sample, firstly because the patient may have failed on first-line therapy or because the uh, antibiotics required may be more sophisticated. Um, and if you send a sample to the laboratory, you write urine, MC and S on the form, M for microscopy. Um, fortunately, most laboratories now actually automate the microscopy. This is a good thing because in my lab, we receive somewhere between 150 and 200,000 urines a year. 
Microscoping urines in a 96-well microtita plate is absolutely mind-numbingly boring. I can tell you in every lab I've ever worked in, it's the one bench that nobody wants to do because you just have to sit there all day looking at about 400 urines down a microscope. Now it's done by a machine which counts the red cells, white cells. Some machines count bacteria, though these are more expensive. Um, and these automated machinery is used to screen out most samples. So if there's no red cells and no white cells, the urine will not get cultured unless it comes from a specific subset of patients who are at greater risk. So anybody in whom finding bacteria is important, which we'll come on to in a minute, or people who you might not expect to have a white cell response. So anybody who's neutropenic because of cancer treatment, for instance, doesn't have any white cells, so the absence of white cells in the urine doesn't really tell you that it's not infection. Um, you will get a quantitative count of white cells, um, and that is important because it's suggestive of the presence of significant infection, although it's not absolute. And then, assuming that the white count is significant, we will go on to culture it on selective agar and do antibiotic sensitivity testing. Have you dipped the urine? We'll cover this in more detail in the group work coming up. Um, this is just a picture of a typical hospital type of urine re dipstick, which covers, as you can see, quite a range of things that you can find. Um, I won't go into this in more detail now because we'll cover it in the next session. So the main problem with the laboratory diagnosis of UTI is that although urine is <coughs> sterile, the area through which it passes to get into our specimen pot is most definitely not sterile. It passes through the perineum. And so unless the urine specimen is taken carefully, what we get is perineal flora. Um, unfortunately, this is the same kind of organisms which do cause urinary tract infection, so you can get significant confusion between whether it's a contaminated specimen or a genuine urinary tract infection. Um, and I've just put a picture on here of a selective plate. This is fairly typical of the kind of agar that we'd use in the lab. You don't need to know the details. But you can probably see on there that there are pink things, there are blue things. If you look very carefully, there are a few white things in the background. Those are all organisms which come off the perineum, and they're also all organisms which can cause urinary tract infection. However, the presence of them in such a mixture as that would lead any lab I know to record that as mixed flora probable contaminants. So we wouldn't go through and pick those all out and give you any sensitivities. We'd just call that probable contamination because it would be very unusual to have a genuine urinary tract infection with that kind of mixture of organisms. The solution to try and sort out these kind of mixtures is to take what we call a midstream specimen of urine. Any of you who ever had to provide a specimen in the GPs will hopefully have been told how to do that. Basically, it involves flushing through the first 10 or 20 mils of the urine specimen and then taking from the midstream. Um, it's pretty hard to do that in kids, um, unless you've got a very compliant, fairly old child. Telling them what you want them to do is pretty tricky. You can do a clean catch. You can do a clean potty specimen, which involves cleaning up the potty first. Um, people do try and do bag urines, but unsurprisingly, nobody, no kid much likes wearing a bag. Um, and just occasionally, we have to make do with pad urines from nappies. Um, but as you might expect, what you get on there is the kind of nappy flora, all the things that are living around that baby's bottom. If it really matters and the diagnosis is absolutely critical, the best, single best specimen is a suprapubic aspirate. And we do get those particularly from neonates in whom the sepsis is uncertain. Um, and this is where the needle is put in through the suprapubic skin directly into the bladder under aseptic techniques. And then any organisms which grow are bound to be significant, providing it's been taken properly. <coughs> this is what microscopy looks like. If you do, are oh, unlucky enough to have to look at it under the microscope. <coughs> the things that we look for, red cells, white cells, and also squamous epithelial cells. Um, squamous epithelial cells come off the perineum, so if they're present in the specimen, it's a sign of contamination. In the laboratory, we not only culture the urine, we actually do a semi-quantitative culture, so a measured amount of urine is taken and spread on a plate, and the number of colonies that grow, so that's the number of clonal um, growth of bacteria, is counted. And there are some old but fairly reliable studies which suggest that the greater than or equal to 10 to 5 bacteria per mil in pure culture is a good predictor of the genuine presence of bacteria in the bladder. <coughs> Asymptomatic bacteriuria is the presence of bacteria in the urine on culture, but no symptoms in the patient. It's incredibly common in old age, which is why we would always say do not take urine specimens from the elderly unless you've got a good reason to. Um, 
I've put on this slide, it's probably best left untreated. There's actually now pretty good studies in old women to show that actually it's definitely best left untreated. The harms of treating are much greater than the harms of leaving it untreated. However, in pregnancy, even asymptomatic bacteria is dangerous because it can predispose to upper urinary tract infection and also to early labour. Um, and so one of the first things that any woman presenting to a midwife will have to do at every appointment is give her a urine specimen, which we will culture regardless of the microscopy. Asymptomatic bacteria urea is also dangerous and warrants treatment in children because the reflux of infected urine up the ureters can damage the kidneys and is the single most common cause of chronic renal failure in children in this country. The urethral syndrome is one of these sort of almost a myth of modern medicine. People talk about it all the time. Um, frequency and dysuria, negative culture results. You, there's lots and lots of um, internet sites about this. Please don't go and Google it. The cause isn't really known. It's probably fairly diverse and different people. It can be difficult to treat, um, but the recommendation would usually to be not to use antibiotics. Sterile pyuria means pus cells, white cells in the urine, but no antibiotics on culture. By far and away, the single commonest cause of this is that the patients had antibiotics sometime before the urine gets to us in the lab. So we still see the white cells, but the bacteria are inhibited. Um, the other cause is urethritis, so a sexually transmitted disease, bacterial vaginosis, and also often top of the list in the textbooks, but uncommon in real life, renal tuberculosis. Catheter-associated urinary tract infection is incredibly common in the hospital population, but also increasingly seen in the community where a lot of chronic disease is now managed. Anybody with a urinary catheter will get it colonised by usually a fairly mixed floor of perineal organisms within a few days. We never want to receive a catheter specimen of urine unless your patient's got symptoms, because we'll grow something and you won't know what to do about it. We would treat if symptomatic. Treatment will work best if you can get the catheter out because antibiotics won't get to the organisms within the, on, sitting on the catheter because they form themselves into a biofilm where they're very hard to reach. Clearly, you can't always remove the catheter, and in those cases, you may have to treat and leave the catheter in place. And always bear in mind that if you have got a colonised catheter and you do something with it, move it, change it, you put your patient at risk of a bacteremia. Catheter-associated urinary tract infection is the single most common type of healthcare-associated infection in the UK. It's been estimated that there are over 20,000 hospital-associated urinary tract infections annually in the UK, with 5% of these patients becoming bacteremic, and a total cost of £125 million per year to the UK health economy. And they lead to unquantifiable but serious unnecessary antimicrobial use. In an attempt to address this, as part of the Saving Lives campaign for the Department of Health, a care bundle for the prevention of catheter-associated UTI was developed. Care bundles are very fashionable in medicine at the moment, and you will encounter them. It basically takes an airline approach of checklisting to ensure that all steps are done and involves auditing regularly against the steps to ensure that people are doing them. Um, although the, all the individual steps, things like minimising catheter use, handling aseptically, inserting under aseptic techniques, all, those, all these things individually have been shown to reduce the risk of catheter-associated UTI. It's interesting that there actually isn't any evidence that the bundle as a whole works in the UK practice. However, the Saving Lives bundles are a normal part of medical practice now, and you will get to see them. Treatment of UTI, um, Professor Pallon will probably come back to briefly when he talks about antimicrobials. As I said before, it would be commonplace now to treat without investigation in primary care, and three days maximum um, would be normal for an uncomplicated UTI. In some cases, we might use a single dose of antibiotics. In pyelonephritis, that is upper urinary tract infection, we'd be more likely to start with a more broad-spectrum antibiotic and then rationalise according to the sensitivities when we've got results. And having talked about antibiotics, I'm now going to hand over to Professor Pallon to tell you a bit more about the uses and abuses. <laughs> right, so we're just going to say a few words about antibiotics now. This is just to scare you. Uh, there's been a lot of scaremongering. Um, perhaps calling it scaremongering is inappropriate because a lot of this 
worries are actually uh, evidence-based and, and real. But uh, there is this idea that you know, we're, we're facing this antibiotic or post-antibiotic apocalypse where we don't have any antibiotics anymore. <coughs> but we're getting ahead of ourselves there by worrying. And let's actually go to the basic principles. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about antimicrobial agents, and in that we include antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal agents. The term antibiotic, in the strict sense, applies only to natural products. Um, and you may encounter some grumpy old examiner that tells you off for calling a, a, a synthetic product an antibiotic at some stage. But in, in real life now, people often use the terms interchangeably um, with anti antimicrobial, antibacterial, antibiotic, or whatever. Now, the key idea is that you're looking to kill microorganisms but not damage the host. So you want to kill the bug here and not the medical student watching television, if you like. Um, and the idea is that these antimicrobial agents are blocking or inhibiting some kind of metabolic pathway that's present in the microorganism but is absent from the, from the human cells. Or if it is present in human cells, is very, very much different, radically different, so that there uh, is this selective toxicity. Just to remind you about, we talk about gram positives and gram negatives. We kind of divide the bacterial universe into gram positives and gram negatives on the basis of the cell wall. And this actually applies also to, the, uh, to many of the drugs we use, which work um, against uh, different kinds of bacteria. So we have some organisms, uh, some agents which will um, only work against gram negatives, uh, things like astreonam. There will be some, like vancomycin, that will only work against gram positive bacteria. And then there will be other agents that will work against both. The other idea that we uh, often draw upon is the idea of the, the spectrum of action. So some agents will have a very narrow spectrum of, age, of action and only work against a, a handful of organisms, or even maybe one organism, one type of species of bacteria. Uh, others will work against a, a, a wide range of different bacteria. And that's important because the broad spectrum agents will have much more of an effect on the whole microbial ecology of the individual and may lay them open to uh, bad side effects, things like Clostridium difficile disease, associated disease, for example, or, or overgrowth by fungi like Candida, if you give these broad spectrums. And they also are applying a selective pressure to all the bacteria associated with the individual, so you're brewing up trouble, you're selecting for resistance uh, more effectively. It's also worth stressing that Antibiotics don't work on viruses, don't work on fungi. We still only use this term for agents active against bacteria. And then we, we use the term antiviral, or antifungal, or antiprotozoal to describe these other agents. Now, we thought about giving you lots of information about the antibiotic targets and the targets of antibiotic resistance, but we realise we have only got one hour and we can't really go into this. But in terms of the targets, here are some of the targets, or these are most of the targets actually categorized here in bacteria that are acted upon by these selective antibacterial agents. Many of the agents actually work on the bacterial cell wall, particularly the beta-lactams, which include cephalosporins and the penicillins and vancomycin. Um, some of the, many other agents work on protein synthesis, and although Protein synthesis in bacteria also relies on ribosomes like it does in, in human cells. The ribosomes in bacteria are sufficiently different that uh, you can get this differential, uh, this selective uh, toxicity effect. Um, in terms of resistance, many bacteria have over time evolved resistance to uh, different antimicrobials. This is a slightly unpredictable kind of uh, uh, process. So. Uh, in some cases, very quickly after an agent's introduced into uh, clinical use, you see resistance to it. In other situations, you can be using an agent for decades and still not see resistance in a particular organism. So, for example, um, the syphilis is still sensitive, uh, by and large, to, to penicillins, even though we've been using them for decades. There are many different ways in which you can become resistant. Um, Bacteria can sling the antibiotic out using various efflux uh, mechanisms, that particular efflux pumps, protein-based pumps that pump antibiotics out. They can come up with ways of 
circumventing the effect of the antibiotics. So they can bypass it by having an alternative <coughs> pathway uh, for making something or an alternative protein that actually acts as an enzyme. Um, you can modify the target. Um, and so the, um, there may be a mutation which affects the active site, which means that it can still do what the bacterium wants it to do as an enzyme, but it's no longer susceptible to that antibiotic. And bacteria also are capable of producing inactivating enzymes. So uh, what we call beta-lactamases are, are very common. These are things that the, that the bacteria produce that will destroy uh, penicillins uh, and in some cases also cephalosporins and degrade them before they can actually have any effect. Now, so what is antimicrobial resistance? The ability of microbes to resist the effects of an agent. Um, in fact, the resistance genes that we now see in hospitals and in other settings out in the community, they've actually been around for a long time. Um, people sometimes get surprised. They go back and look at culture collections from the 1940s. They all look at all these resistance genes. But in fact, these genes have actually been evolving out there in, in the biosphere, in the environment, and they're part of an arms race between bacteria and other bacteria, bacteria and fungi, bacteria and protozoa, and so forth. Uh, um, and all these agents, these antimicrobial agents, are there being used uh, as as weapons in, in, their, in their kind of microbial ecology. But what we've seen in the last few decades in human use of antibiotics is that we've put a huge selective pressure. And this is basically Darwin in the drugstore. It's natural selection in real life. You know, upsets creationists to talk about it this way. But this is a very <laughs> cogent example of where, we, where we're seeing evolution happening in real life. You apply, you apply antibiotics to an environment, to the hospital, to a patient. Um, there may be a billion bacteria, but one of them is resistant. You select for that one bacterium, it grows up, and then it becomes the, the next population of bacteria. Um, and there's been a lot of controversy about whether we're actually breeding up resistance in, in human clinical medicine by using antibiotics as supplements to animal feed. Uh, they're very widely used in veterinary medicine. They're also sometimes used in agriculture. And um, to cut a long story short, I think people have reached the view that it's a good idea not to do this. And so, they, for example, they've been banned as routine growth enhancers in animals in Europe, but not in other parts of the world. Um, now, we hope that we can minimise the risk of resistance if we use antibiotics correctly. Um, we are, and use them only when needed. So there is this, this, this whole resistance pressure. And if we can take that pressure away, then we won't see so much resistance emerging. The problem is also that we don't just see resistance to one antibiotic or two antibiotics, but we often now are seeing antibiotic resistances stacking up within bacteria. So we talk about multi-drug resistant or multi-resistant bacteria. I should say multi-drug resistant bacteria. Now, sometimes we, a lot of these are actually opportunistic pathogens. They're not likely to affect people out, healthy people out in the community. Um, but even that is, is something that's changing now. But many of these will affect patients in the hospital. Um, and some of these are just inherently multi-drug resistant. So there's an organism called Stenotrophomonas maltophilia, which just is resistant as part of its nature. Um, and so we select for that in the environment. But we also select for multi-drug resistant varieties of some common organisms. So MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, usually is multi-drug resistant. Um, but these are variants of Staphylococcus aureus, which is a, an organism that many of you are carrying in your nose. It's just a we've, we've selected for it in hospital environments. And similarly with drug resistance in E. coli. So resistance can arise effectively from two different kinds of genetic <coughs> mechanism. So when we're talking about you know, causality in biology, we can look at the, the resistance arising because we're using lots of antibiotics. But the other explanation is, how is it actually arising at the molecular level? Well, one um, source is that you get point mutations in the chromosome of a bacterium or of a fungus or whatever, or, or quite commonly in viruses. This is a common way, say, HIV will evolve to become resistance by a, a, a 
requiring a series of point mutations and, uh, until it actually the target of a particular agent is no longer susceptible to that agent. That's one way to do it. But another, perhaps more worrying way in which bacteria do this is they acquire resistance genes on what we call mobile genetic elements. So, in a sense, this is bacterial sex. They're exchanging DNA with each other and they're involved in kind of global group sex. They're exchanging resistance genes all across the world. And as people are jumping in aeroplanes, we'll see a resistance gene in an in intensive care unit in North America, and then you'll see it in, in Europe, and then you'll see it in Japan. Um, and these resistance determinants, not only are they geographically mobile, and that we see them all over the world, but they're also are able to jump quite large distances. So some of them can jump from gram positives to gram negatives, or gram negatives to gram positives, for example. And in fact, there's been one, there's one plasmid that that will actually uh, transfer DNA from a bacterium into human cells. It's so promiscuous in its desire to just mate with anything it comes across. The problem is that these elements are not just mobile, but they also can stack up the determinants multiply on the same mobile element. Um, so here's an example of, a, a, of a, an antibiotic resistance plasmid, as we call them. These are circular pieces of DNA which can often mobilize themselves from one cell to the other. Um, and it, it's stacked up here, uh, canamycin resistance, sulfonamide resistance, ampicillin resistance. It's got mercury resistance as well. So although we don't use mercury as, a, um, as an antibiotic, an anti, anti, antibacterial agent in, in terms of treating people, uh, for some reason we do see these kind of heavy metal resistances also stacked up as well. Now, I mentioned this when I went, we went through that... Um, <coughs> that uh, figure a, a couple of slides back, but basically here are just the ways in which uh, you can get resistance. You, know, you, change, you get rid of the structure that the antibiotic inhibits, you make the organism impermeable, uh, you inactivate the antibiotic, you modify the target, a resistant uh, pathway, or you just pump the antibiotic out. And there's a, a lot of interest in, in, in investigating these efflux pumps. They're very widespread in nature. And this some interest in seeing if you can actually reverse resistance by inhibiting the efflux pump, uh, and that's an active area of research at the moment. So why do we care about this? Why has this got any relevance to us? Well, the thing is that basically there's a ratchet effect. So infections that we used to be able to treat with particular antibiotics are no longer treatable with those uh, antibiotics, and you have to re revise your choice of antibiotics, use more complex regimes, um, and so penicillin resistant streptococcus pneumonia, streptococcus pneumonia used to be uniformly sensitive to penicillin, but now we have to treat with a broad <coughs> spectrum cephalosporin instead. Um, in a sense, it, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's very different from the whole of the rest of pharmacology, because if you develop a new drug against uh, hypertension today, you could come back in 50 years' time, and you know that drug will still behave the same way and still be just as good as it was. Maybe there'll be better drugs, but that drug will still work. Whereas with antibiotics, you come back 50 years from when you've introduced a drug, and it may not work at all anymore. In some cases, we have hardly any antibiotics left at all. Um, one that we've worked on in, in my group is something called multidrug resistant Acinetobacter baumannii, which can spread around in hospitals. And um, in some cases, there really are no antibiotics left to treat it. The one thing that we uh, have worried about for several years, so far it hasn't become very, uh, sent, uh, very uh, prevalent, but the, the idea is that we might get vancomycin resistant Staph aureus to take over from MRSA. Currently we treat MRSA with vancomycin, uh, but if we lost that, then we, you know, we would slowly lose our ability to treat. Um, and resistance rates generally are increasing across, uh, across the world. Now, we already spoke about antimicrobial susceptibility testing, so it's just to remind you that the common way in which this is done for bacteria is that you uh, make a lawn of the bacteria, um, you apply a, a, a disc that's got the antibiotic, and you incubate overnight. The antibiotic diffuses out the disc, and if the, the organism is susceptible, you will see a zone of clearing around the disc, and if it's resistant, it grows up to the disc. That's a simple way in which we do it. If we really want to know quite how sensitive or resistant uh, 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 a, a given bacterium is, 
we do a rather more sophisticated test known as the MIC test, or the Minimum Inhibitory Concentration Test. What this involves is that we actually make doubling <coughs> dilutions of the antibiotic in a series of tubes, and we add some broth that will support the growth of the antibiotic as well, and then we put in a, just a little uh, drop of, anti uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of culture uh, containing the bacterium, and we leave it to grow overnight. Um, and the next morning we look and see which of those uh, tubes have become uh, cloudy. Um, and what you'll find is the smallest amounts of antibiotic won't have had any effect and, and the bacterium will have just grown through them um, and so on <coughs> as you go up. But there will come a point where suddenly the antibiotic actually stops the bacterium from growing. It doesn't have to kill the bacterium, but it stops <coughs> it from growing to make that cloudiness. Um, and we call uh, the, um, the, 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 the tube in which, the, the first tube which, which is clear is known as the MIC, the minimum inhibitory concentration, because that's the minimum <coughs> amount of antibiotic needed to prevent the growth of the bacterium. Now, we're covering a huge range of subjects here, but let's just focus in again, uh, focus in here on actual clinical use of antibiotics. So project yourselves onto the wards thinking you're going to be looking after patients. And you've got a patient in front of you. What, these are the kind of questions you have to ask. Is this, does this patient actually need antibiotics? What's the best treatment? Uh, kind of organisms, where's the infection, how much, how often, how much does it cost, are there problems? Um, and have you taken bacterial specimens first? So one of the things we always like to try and get into people's heads is you've got the patient in front of you. Take your samples first for analysis and then give your antibiotic. You're only delaying things by couple of minutes, five minutes or whatever. But if you do that, then you're much more likely to get a, a diagnosis from the laboratory. Because even a single dose of antibiotics is enough to actually uh, uh, destroy the bacteria in a, in a given sample, because the antibiotics can continue working as the sample goes off to the lab and so forth. So you have to start by thinking about what kind of drug are you going to use, what kind of dose are you going to use, when are you going to give it, how long are you going to give it for? And, and here are some of the other questions that, that you might address here. Um, you, we tend to ask people to start, um, well, to use as narrow a spectrum agent as you can and to prefer using oral agents to IV agents if you can. But in the severely ill patient, where you don't know what's going on, you may well start with IV uh, broad spectrum agents, but then you should consider when you get the, the microbiology results, rationalizing your choice and actually coming in with something much more specific. So just focusing a bit more in, on, those, on some of those questions, does this patient actually need antibiotics? And this is the issue about overuse of antibiotics. So many patients go and see their their general practitioner and get treated when they don't need to. Um, so is the patient even infected? As we, we know that some patients who present with what might be vaguely considered symptoms of UTI actually aren't infected at all and, and they don't need antibiotics. I mean, this is a lively question actually as to how much you should bother to investigate those patients or just treat them blindly. Um, and I, I actually didn't know that the Royal College of General Practitioners was just saying treat them all blindly now. Um, you know, you can argue that there's probably a large number of people who don't have UTIs who are getting antibiotics for them. Is it a viral infection? You know, antibiotics don't work against the common cold, um, and they don't work against any viral infection. And and so going to your doctor saying, "Oh, I've got a cold," putting pressure on the doctor to give you antibiotics is is a bad thing to be doing. And doctors try and not yield to that. Sometimes the infections will just clear up themselves. Or they're self-limiting. So most of the time when patients have diarrhea, we don't give them antibiotics because most diarrhea clears up within a couple of days. It's an inconvenience. It's unpleasant for the patient at the time, but we know that they will get better. And you know, in many situations, there are more appropriate treatments than just giving the patient antibiotics. So the antibiotics may be used as, an, as a, a sort of ancillary approach to something else, or maybe you don't even need the antibiotics, you just need to do something else. So 
if someone's got bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, then giving them lots of physiotherapy, make clearing up all their secretions. This is probably much more effective than giving them antibiotics. Uh, and there's the old adage that we use and the surgeons use, which is the treatment of pus is drainage. So if you see someone's got an abscess, it's no point in trying to give them lots and lots of antibiotics. Or someone's got appendicitis, don't try and treat them with antibiotics. You go in there surgically and deal with the problem surgically. Um, and similarly, when there's a foreign body, it's a plastic or metal, uh, in, 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 in a, they're associated with that infection, acting as a as, as nidus for infection, then you really have to remove that foreign body because antibiotics alone will not sterilize these inanimate uh, surfaces, metals and plastics and so forth. Um, and the only real hope you have is to remove the foreign body. There are plenty of situations where people try and use antibiotics, but almost always they're on a hiding to nothing. What about the right kind of drug? Well, we, we can sometimes predict exactly that they're going to be susceptible. I mentioned syphilis, another one, streptococcus pyogenes, penicillin intensive. Um, but for many organisms, we, we can't be quite so certain, and so we might have to use sensitivity testing. So in urinary tract infections, although you might get away with giving some agents and the patients get better, but some of the patients won't get better and they'll come back two days later and say the antibiotics haven't worked. In that situation, you clearly need to take a sample and then actually look at the sensitivities and um, resistance patterns and choose a drug which you know will work. Where we Obviously, there is, with common things like urinary tract infection in the community, there is a pressure to just treat and not bother to investigate. But even there, if we investigate a percentage and sample some of those patients, we can get an idea of what's going on. So, you know, is there lots of ampicillin resistance, trimethoprim resistance, resistance to other uh, agents in this particular population, in which case we can't use those agents, we have to use something else. The other issue is, is in terms of the right drug, is that the drug has to get to where it has to, to be active. So if we give gentamicin intravenously, for example, this is a drug that's commonly used intravenously, it doesn't actually get into your gut, it doesn't get into your cerebral spinal fluid, so it's no good giving gentamicin for uh, abdominal sepsis that, and expect it to, well, you can give it for abdominal sepsis, but not for, for, for any kind of gut-related infection. Um, and also, it won't help with um, treating meningitis very well. Some drugs actually accumulate where, they, where they're wanted much better than we would anticipate. So there's a drug called erith azithromycin, which actually gets into cells. Even though if we try and measure the levels in the serum, it looks like it's, there's not much of it around and it's probably not going to work. But actually, it does get accumulated in the cells. And so um, it's more effective than you expect. And similarly, amoxicillin, if you're treating a urinary tract infection, the amount of amoxicillin, most of it goes out in the urine. So the levels that you get in the urine are, are, are much higher than you might expect if you just looked at serum levels. You also have to think about, what about the patient? Is there a problem using antibiotics in this particular patient? And there are lots of different groups of patients. They're not all the same. There's a lot of <coughs> emphasis these days on stratified medicine. Um, but in, in, in many ways, this is just part of general medicine, is you will have to look at that patient and work out your treatment um, based on the, on the patient in front of you and their particular issues. So allergy is a particular problem, uh, particularly with penicillins. It said about 10% of people are, I think it's in the figures, uh, are allergic to penicillin. There's, there are problems because a lot of people say they're allergic, but they're actually not. And you say, what happened? Or oh, I felt a bit funny when I took them and whatever. And so it's a very difficult issue is to, to call whether someone really is allergic or not. Uh, and it often you have to make a, a judgment there. Um, there's a particular rash that you get with ampicillin if someone's got uh, various hematological problems, glandular fever or lymphoma. It's not related to penicillin allergies. And then there are various side effects that you'll get. Uh, a lot of those are, are gastrointestinal. You can get nausea and vomiting with antibiotics. Erythromycin, well known for actually chewing into your stomach, making you feel dreadful. Um, at the other end, other extremity, Clostridium difficile is associated with antibiotic-associated diarrhea, um, and that can actually kill people. I think I saw the figure that more people die from C. diff than than die on the roads, if I remember <coughs> rightly. It, it is a serious problem. 
Um, and the other thing you get is overgrowth of resistant organisms. So this Darwinian effect, you select for the resistant organisms by killing off everything else. Um, and so candida infection, often called thrush, is seen in the community. So if you get antibiotics, sorry, I want to ask a question there. Um, that's a good question. So some <laughs> patients are allergic just to the penicillin. Some are allergic to penicillins and cephalosporins. Uh, so I assume that some, in some patients it's, it's not the actual beta-lactam ring. It must be some of the side chains. But I don't know. Do you know anything about the exact it's determinants? Side it's usually the side chains, yeah. Which, which side chains vary. Different patients are allergic. But I don't. I have no. I don't know idea in evolutionary terms why people are allergic to penicillin. Whether there's a genetic basis as well, what what, what led to happen? But it's just a nuisance. But you're right. It's an interesting question as to why it should happen. Um, so candida in the community, you, you often get vaginal candidiasis, and in children, if they get given antibiotics, you often get candida in the mouth. You get thrush in the mouth. That's where it gets its name from. It's supposed to look like the the belly of a, of a thrush, I think. Um, and in hospitalised patients in the intensive care unit, um, these patients will often get multiple drug-resistant organisms and fungal infections like candida. Um, there are lots of other side effects. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, uh, but there was, you know, different organs can get affected and, and different drugs have very specific uh, effects. The other problem is that uh, patients sometimes have all kinds of metabolic disorders, so they may be in renal failure or liver failure, and they're not handling the drugs in the way that a normal person would, and so you have to be careful about that. You might make their renal failure worse by giving them a drug, um, or you might make the other side effects worse because of their renal failure, they're not getting rid of the drug. Lots of drug interactions, so if you give someone gentamicin and furosemide, um, you're going to make them deaf probably. Um, then there are issues about pregnancy, breastfeeding, use in children. And in fact, if you look in the British National Formulary, there's a lot of advice here about what drugs should be used, uh, how they should be used with caution in certain situations. Right time, right dose. Well, we've got the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics um, and how uh, the um, antibiotic is actually being handled by the body, how it's actually interacting with the agent. Um, and getting the dose in the right uh, dosage regime. There's been lots of interest in, you know, say with gentamicin, whether you give it multiple times or you just give one big dose. Um, and, and there's this idea of the golden hour, that you, um, if you give appropriate antibiotics quickly, then you increase the chances of survival. Although we, there was a lot of discussion on Twitter the other day about this as to whether the, the evidence base for this, how strong it is. But there, um, it's clear that giving antibiotics quickly is, is a good idea, according to most of the profession at least. Um, so that was just a broad overview. If we're looking at UTI, uh, we, we have um, to consider whether we're looking at something simple like just a cystitis. Uh, there we would just... We give one of these three agents, trimethoprim, nitrofurantoin, and amoxicillin. Um, if it's a complex UTI and sending UTI, then we might have to start thinking about um, ciprofloxacin as a broader spectrum agent. We might even give injectable agents like gentamicin uh, and things like carbapenems if we were worried about multi-drug resistance and we didn't quite know what we were dealing with. Um, and, and again, the advice here is always to look at the BNF. So the advice, so you know, there, there will be changes from year to year, uh, from decade to decade, as to what you would treat a different condition with, particularly based on its patterns of resistance. Um, there is this joke that if you ask two antibiotic, uh, two, two microbiologists for an opinion, they'll give you three different opinions, um, and. If you ask working groups in different countries to tell us what we should do in terms of treatment of UTI, you actually get different <coughs> durations of treatment recommended in different countries. In general, uh, this, these are the figures here for, for UTI, but in, 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 um, in general terms, 
we try and advise people to use antibiotics for as short a time as possible. And it's a kind of irony that the medical microbiologists in the hospital spend more, probably more time telling people to stop antibiotics than advising them on when to start antibiotics. And now I'm going to pass over to Esther, who's going to finish off with the last you know, five or ten minutes. <coughs> Well, so that, that is a bit of one of those myths, really, to finish the whole course. There are certain conditions where we know it is very important to finish the whole course. So tuberculosis is one, for example, where there's clear evidence base that you have to give treatment for a certain amount of time, otherwise it doesn't work. Uh, treatment of um, uh, scarlet fever, streptococcal infection, rheumatic fever, again, to prevent rheumatic fever, there's quite a, a good evidence base there. Um, but in many situations, we don't really, you know, there's not, if, if, you took the, if you took one less drug, you took one less tablet than the, the full course, it's not likely to give you too much trouble. Um, one of the problems in medicine is that we've moved towards evidence-based medicine, and we used to come up with these, we used to come up with expert recommendations, and now you look at the expert recommendations and say, well, where's the evidence base that three days in, it, well, five days is better than three days, or seven days is better than three days. And people have tended to move towards trying to just cut back and cut back. Is there anything you would say on that? I'd say that we're increasingly getting evidence that shorter courses for most things are better. So the UTI recommendations are largely based on studies which show that actually the outcomes are as good with a short course. So Ventilator-associated pneumonia is something that we're particularly reducing courses for in hospital. If you look at the old literature, people were giving 14 to 28 days. There's now studies coming out of the mainland Europe which show that five days are plenty. So the outcome is no worse at 28. No, that, that's a, a bit of a myth, really. I mean, it, 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 for, for tuberculosis, for things like HIV, you know, there are certain situations <coughs> where you've got plenty of morbidities where that is the case. But you're more likely to relax if you don't finish the course and you haven't got effective treatment. But it's not like this course you just simply that for an individual UTI, um, which, which is what you get sick of get sick of it and get people to do. But I would think most. Most patients probably get better after the first dose or the first two doses, and even three days is probably more than you need for most of them. But it was, it was this year to be with you know, all the patients, not eighty percent of them. And one of the problems is that you know people are, are still very defensive. They don't like the idea. They want to say, "I really, really want to make sure that I treat this infection. I want to kill this organism with stone dead," and they're not prepared to just step back and say, well, actually, patients are robust and they will survive. Um, and so, uh, okay, we had some discussion, obviously, going on earlier this week about the treatment of ICU patients and how important it is to treat them aggressively or whether you should actually relax. Because if you treat them aggressively, this is one area where you select a resistance uh, by giving them lots of antibiotics and perhaps they don't need them. Okay, well, I've got 10 minutes left to talk about the control of infection, um, which is frankly clearly inadequate, um, as control of infection is something that you will all need to engage with, something that is incredibly important. You'll have seen headlines like these ones, um, unsafe and dirty hospitals, uh, the mid-staff inquiry is something that's very much at the forefront of the medical profession's mind at the moment. Hopefully you've all seen the report, the Francis inquiry, um, <coughs> one of the many things that failed at mid-staffs was the cleaning. Um, this headline from BBC Scotland, doctors who fail on hand washing should be sanctioned. Um, it has been suggested that hand washing is the single most effective medical intervention that you can do. So stuff all the expensive antibiotics, anything else, washing your hands between patients will save more lives than anything else you can do. Um, it's not very exciting, it's not very technological, but actually there are really good evidence-based studies that show that proper hand washing really is important. And then, of course, there's things um, around controlling other infections. Um, swine flu was very much at the forefront of people's 
mines a couple of years ago. We saw lots of hospital wards close. Swine flu at the moment has gone away, but there are likely to be new and emerging infections which continue to cause problems. And control of infection is everyone's responsibility. Okay, so every trust will have an infection control committee, an infection control doctor, probably tens of infection control nurses in big trusts, but it's not just their responsibility, it's yours too. Um, for some reason, this is coming up as multiple slides. I'm not going to read out the definitions. You can all read them for yourselves on the slides later. Um, but just to point out that adequate sterilization and cleaning, uh, antisepsis actually starts with cleaning. So something that isn't clean can never be sterile. And that applies to hands as well. So hands have to be adequately clean before you can make, render them as sterile as possible. Um, I'm going to have to skip through these. I really haven't got time to deal with all the um, definitions, I'm afraid. Again, you can read them on the Moodle, and you should go and get a basic textbook of infection and read the chapter on infection control. We will deal a bit more detail with infection control in one of your clinical skills sessions in December, so there'll be an opportunity to practice hand washing and discuss some of the issues around it then. Um, and <coughs> infection control is something that you should all be encountering in the individual trusts when you go out to them. Where do patients get infections from? Um, most of this is common sense. Um, you can get them from other people around you, either people who are sick, people who are well, um, or indeed from yourself. Most urinary tract infection comes from your own gut flora, except in the case of catheterized patients in ITU, where person-to-person -person spread occurs through dirty hands of healthcare workers generally. You get infection from animals around you, um, animals in the food chain, particularly important, Salmonella, Campylobacter, um, and you can get food, you can get um, infections from the environment around you. In the hospital, same is true, except that by far and away the most common source of infection is either person to person or person to environment to person. So over the past few years, we've got very exercised about Clostridium difficile, and that's because C. diff is an organism which can form spores in the environment. Spores are basically like seeds. They have a very resistant outer coating, these things can live in the environment for weeks, months, or even years, and they're resistant to a lot of cleaning methods. They're also completely resistant to the alcohol ham gels, which is something that become very prevalent in hospital practice. In a patient who's got C. diff, if you've been near that patient or in their room or environment, alcohol ham gel is completely useless. You have to use soap and water. It may seem old-fashioned, but in fact, it's been shown that good old-fashioned soap and water is far better than alcohol in that scenario. You can also get infections from Food in hospital, um, any of you who's ever been a patient will know that hospital food tends to be dry, tasteless, and that is because it's basically been cooked within an inch of its life to make sure that nobody in hospital can possibly get a foodborne infection. Um, that, of course, is a good thing, but the fact that the food is dry and tasteless is not a good thing. Um, and that's a difficult thing to resolve when you think of your average hospital and how many patients they have to feed. And that's before you can get anywhere near the hospital canteen and the food that the doctors have to eat. Um, other sources of infection in the hospital environment, things we worry about. Obviously, if you go to theatre, there are strict issues around what you can wear, how you can wash your hands, who they'll allow in theatre. Instruments have to be <coughs> sterile because they're a, a significant source of infection, if not. Um, and the air and dust in hospitals have very high bacterial counts because there are lots of people. And you can do studies in theatres to show that any area which has more traffic, the surgeons who like to have lots of medical students in theatre coming in and out, um, the bacteria counts are hugely higher because you are shedding skin cells all the time. With those skin cells come bacteria. They settle out in the dust and they contaminate the environment. Um, I'm going to skip over these as well because we really are running short time. Having talked about the sources of infection enables you to see what we would do to control infection. So you remove the reservoir. Um, you, again, cannot possibly have missed all the headlines about those poor badgers being culled. That's about removing the reservoir of bovine TB. There are lots of arguments around whether actually badgers are enough of a reservoir, but I'm not going to deal with that today. Um, you interrupt transmission. So you separate the source from the um, vulnerable patient, or you make the vulnerable patient more resistant. Vaccination is incredibly important in stopping the spread of infection. You'll know that smallpox has been eradicated <laughs> globally because of vaccination, and we're heading towards polio eradication. Sadly, the WHO targets keep being missed because we aren't getting on top of polio, but vaccination is incredibly important. When you're house officers, you can get involved with that. Elderly patients in hospital are very vulnerable to flu. 
they should all be vaccinated against flu every winter. We do campaigns every winter to try and get all our elderly patients vaccinated, and typically we manage to hit rates of about 30%, which is poor. Um, and that is largely because that intervention is not being owned by the ward doctors. So it's seen as something that infection control come in and do because they think it's a good thing. But actually, these are your elderly vulnerable patients, and you know these are things that you can be thinking about and real differences you can make. Clean hands, obviously, clean hands do save lives. Um, wash your hands, and as I say, we'll come back to that in the clinical skills session, um, and I've already talked a bit about hospital food um, and the issues around that. Hand washing, everybody needs to do it all the time, even your consultants. There's meant to be a culture in the NHS where you aren't afraid to challenge people. So if you see somebody walk on a ward and they don't wash their hands, it should be possible, even if it's the consultant surgeon of whom you are absolutely terrified, for you to go up and say, excuse me, but you need to wash your hands. Clearly, actually, there is not a culture like that in the NHS yet. We are still very hierarchical. It's very difficult for people to challenge things. But you can start in a small way, making a difference, setting an example. The other very important thing in controlling infection within hospital is isolating infectious patients. <coughs> This is something that, again, the infection control team spend a lot of time doing, but again, it's not just our responsibility, it's your responsibility too. Pretty much every month, I have to spend time dealing with the ramifications of an infectious patient who's been admitted onto a ward and put in an open bay. Sometimes, particularly at this time of year, it's somebody with norovirus. So they've come in with diarrhea and vomiting, they've been admitted, and they're on an open ward. Well, guess what happens next? 24 hours later, the rest of that ward has got diarrhea and vomiting. What do we do? Well, we have to close the ward. That's clearly a disaster. Um, because then you've got all these beds which are blocked um, and you get patients backing up in A&E. Heartlands, where I work, despite the fact that it's still only October, has been on red bed alert for the last six weeks. We are not managing to discharge enough patients to admit them from A&E and the trolley waits are already over four hours every day. That's an issue politically, but actually it's an issue for your patients. If you've ever lain on an A&E trolley, it is vile. They are hard, they are uncomfortable, they are cold, they are dangerous because people roll off them. We need to keep beds clear. And one of the very important things for doing that is putting infected patients in a side room. If you are the admitting F1, seeing the patient in A&E with vomiting, the first question after, is this patient OK, do they need immediate resuscitation, will be, can we get this patient out of A&E? And if so, where can I put them? I need to be asking for a side room. The other situation in which I see this a lot is TB. Um, TB is one of those things that's slightly thought of as a historical problem in the UK. It's not. You're all currently working in the West Midlands. The West Midlands and East London are the two places in the UK where TB incidence is highest. It's now 72 per 100,000 in East Birmingham, which after London is the highest incidence in the whole of Western Europe. You will see a case of TB. If you don't think about it, you'll miss it. Your patient will go into the open ward and you will have infected other vulnerable patients. You'll also have put staff at risk because staff increasingly have medical problems of their own. They may be immunocompromised. Immunocompromised staff are not allowed to work with patients with tuberculosis for really good reason. But if you haven't thought about that diagnosis and you haven't isolated the patient, you may be putting your colleagues at risk as well. And the lesson from this is always, if you don't know, ask. Ask us. We like to be asked. There are lots and lots of policies and procedures. You can't possibly know them all by heart, but any trust you work in will have a good intranet site where you can consult them. And finally, you have a responsibility to the wider community as well. Um, since I've been working in clinical medicine, the public health legislation has finally been updated. When I started, we were working with quite a lot of 19th century legislation, unbelievably, that just hadn't been changed. In 2010, they finally got around to putting through a new Control of Infection Act, and it states very clearly that all registered medical practitioners, so that's from the day you graduate from medical school, you have a responsibility to notify to the public health authorities if you have a patient with a disease which causes them to be a risk to the community. You are allowed to notify. This is one of the few cases where consent is not required. You are allowed to notify without consent. Of course, it's good practice to get consent, but if it's a, a disease which causes risk to the community, you're allowed to notify without it. And it is your responsibility, not mine in the labs, although you will often find that we have also notified. Um, the full list of notifiable diseases is available from the Public Health England website. And again, if you're not sure, consult your friendly microbiologist. We're always happy to help. <laughs> <laughs>